So he's he's definitely um, attached to the wall. Whether that means you know it's a uh, it, you know, um, fastened so far as like some kind of straps or, or things like that, we don't know. You get the sense that he can kind of move like a little bit because there's the one part where he actually tries to move and then like realizes, oh yeah, I'm stuck. Um, so there's there's definitely something there that, that that's kind of keeping. Um, to, and, and in the film, you do see him like with his hands and everything like he's, he's stuck to the wall. Um, from and not worried about you know Jesus, John the Baptist, and all that kind of stuff. In in, in simpler terms, though, what does he kind of represent? Or at least, why is he stuck to the wall? Because he's stuck to the back. Um, why? So he was a disruption. Um, he he was not fixed. So he 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 is not a success story. Tabor would be a person who was quote unquote fixed. Um, and that's the and Tabor is the one that big nurse kind of goes into and starts telling the other nurses about, oh, we had a person named Tabor, and then we did this test and whatnot, and we kind of became better. So he's one where, you know, it did not work. Um, he was a disruption. So he has gone through EST. It did not fix him. It kind of went a little haywire to the point where he cannot control himself at all, you know, so far as bodily functions and, and whatnot. Why, though, and if, assuming that you're looking at Big Nurse as kind of being the antagonistic force, I mean, she, she kind of has to be the villain. If McMurphy's going to be like the root hero kind of character, uh, McMurphy or uh, Bruce Rector kind of has to therefore be that antagonist, be that villain. If Big Nurse is actually black like Alex, then what would you say? Hanging on the wall in front of everyone else, where he's going to be, you know, in his own stuff. It's an example. If you step out of line, you could be that guy. And she never says that, but that's certainly something that people know that's going to want to keep them from having to go up the stairs and all those guys like that before he goes down um, back for the pole and all of those things. So in, <clears throat> in some ways, it's kind of like a symbol or a foreshadowing of what could happen you know, if you kind of step out of line. Which, you know, it's one of the first characters that McMurphy kind of goes up to and shakes hands with. You know, goes up to shakes hands and he's just, I'm going to step back over here right now. But, you know, for someone who is thinking about going up against Nurse and, and going to be that opposing force, that's someone that you would want to kind of be, be behind that. Now, you know, going, well, he's Jesus and all those kinds of things. Now, I don't think he is, but he's up there on the wall. He's certainly being... Um, punished for what he has done, um, and, and so it does kind of come to become a little symbolic of the sins that could take, that could take place, of course. Um, but really, in, in a way, you know, I said John the Baptist and all that kind of stuff, he kind of baptizes McMurphy in the sense of this is what life is like on the ward, this is how it could be for you, um, you know, by being on your knees and all that kind of stuff. So, but, you know, it's, he's definitely to the wall, because even Hardy makes reference to, you know, our friend Alice over there, um, well, they're not going to go up and remove him at some point. Um, but I, I don't think the, the nails part is too much of a deal. Well, it's not so much for, it's not on the wall, it's not, Morgan, back to the wall, you know, because you're, you're being that kid again. Um, the the EST, the shock therapy, would kind of be more of this is a punishment, this is a deterrent for you to not kind of act that way anymore. He, he's, he's essentially a vegetable at this point, but he can't do anything. So by him being on the wall, he's not going to be disturbing other people or, or whatnot. Does Nurse, you know, consciously go, let's put Morgan over on the wall so then when everyone comes into the room, they'll see her and they'll be like, oh, I don't want to be like that patient. That part we don't know for sure. I think it certainly kind of seems to be within her realm, within her, her possibility. But it's not, 
you're going to be punished, so we're going to put you on the wall. The after effects of the punishment is there's no other place for you to go other than you know, going right up there and being put on the wall. Yeah. 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 She's she's kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place, you know, as to what you do. If if you give, you know, a, a whole lot of freedom to everyone, um, she's probably right. You know, well, we decided that if on the weekends, if you had free reign, you would then go back to bed after breakfast and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And you, as readers, are going, yeah, I think I would on my Saturday. I'm going to go back. I'm not even getting up for breakfast. I'm going to stay in bed. But because you patients feel that you, and they are self-admitted, because you are having difficult times, you know, you're struggling within society, within collective groups, we want you to be together so that you can learn to interact with one another. Yeah, there, there certainly is rationale reason that, that makes sense with that. I think she's a character that as, as you go through the book, she does start to come off as being a little bit more manipulative um, with some things that she does. And I think the... Um, when, when they have the meeting after, you know, she's flipping out on them for watching the, uh, the World Series, watching the World Series on the gray screen, um, and the doctors are going through, oh, it's this, 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 yes, we're going to do this. He's just a man. We're not going to let him be a martyr. He's just a regular, ordinary man. You kind of get, I think that's when you kind of start to see a little bit of a, of a darker element to her, where, okay, it, it seems to be becoming more of a, I'm going to break this person um, kind of thing in, in, in a certain way. Now, let's be honest, though. Who is McMurphy? He's a gambling con man who does probably tend to take people's weaknesses and use them to her advantage. So you could flip the script and argue that she has a responsibility to break him as a man so that he doesn't hurt any of his patients and whatnot. Um, so that's where things kind of get a, a gray area. I don't think that she would be like a flat, static character, that this is all that she is. Um, the, the black boys would be static characters, um, and flat. This, this is who they are, and they don't change. You know? um, she's one where I think it is a little bit tough. Um, I, I do think she's good at playing mental games with people, and, and certainly, you know, with the conversation that they have with Harding at that second party at the very beginning, she's really good at, at getting people to feel uncomfortable with who they are, and, and she's able to kind of use that to her advantage. But uh, she's, she's in a tough spot, you know, depending upon if, if you give like Murphy free reign and all that kind of stuff, your ward is going to turn, you know, upside down. Your ward is going to be trying to run all over the place, and now we're having to nail a whole bunch of people up for that. Yeah, she won't. So, yeah, I, I don't think she's the classic bad guy. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying quite like different question, but kind of like in, in the same vein a little bit. Is McMurphy um, a potential? Just because we don't know yet, is he a potential savior? What's your gut say? Could he save these people? And, and you're kind of going in the direction I wanted you to, so thank you for that. That's good. Thank you. Appreciate it. 
Okay. If 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 you're going to be, you need two things to have a savior. Any idea what those two things would be, or one of those two things? You need to, that's a good answer. That's what I was looking for. You need people who need to be saved. And then you also need one other thing that's going to go along with that. Um, like a reason to save them? Yeah, in the sense of you need, not only do you need people who need to be saved, but they need to be saved from something. So there's a reason. There's, there's some kind of force that is causing these people who are going to rely upon a savior. Um, so whether, yeah, it's a motive, whether it's some kind of conflict, whether it's a bad guy, there's, there's got to be some kind of reason for it. And so to kind of go back to Nurse Ratchet, we have people who would need to be saved, you know, in a, in a Cheswick where it's going to be unsuccessful, we now know, but a Harding, a Bibbit, a Chief. Well, if we have people, who, if we're going to agree that they need to be saved, then what is it that they're going to have to be saved from? At least part of it's going to be Nurse Ratchet. Maybe not 100% Nurse. It could be other aspects of society. It could even be from themselves in some sort of way, you know, where, um, and, and kind of mentioning that they need to take a stand for themselves and then kind of own up to something. You certainly could save a person from him or herself, but part of that force, that driving force for him, is I would think is going to be nurse. So I think it's perfectly fine to go, she's not the prototypical evil villain. She's not Cruella de Vil, you know, with all the Dalmatians kind of running around. Um, but she kind of fits the mold for what we need. Didn't say that. You just jump in the gun here. Just because there's a Bible doesn't mean it's going to be Jesus. Do you remember this? Dark for the heart of darkness. Okay, so Ethan already started us going there with the heads on sticks. So I telepathically knew he was going to do that. Had this thing ready to go. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, for ye are like whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but within are full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanliness. And then up at the top, beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Anything about those two? That, And, and to keep kind of going with that, she's always described as like porcelain skin, you know, very dainty. What's her uniform? White. Starched white. What are the black boys wearing? White. What are the walls and the floor and the ceiling? Everything's white, you know, all, all this beautiful stuff, um, or at least all this clean stuff. But what's inside? What's happening? Well, if you have a Cheswick. You have, even though Ellis is alive, but you have an Ellis, you have a Rawler, a Squaller upstairs, um, you know, the castrates himself on the latrine. You certainly, within this white pristine thing, have some, some issues going on. Probably one of the more odd characters, just the way the Chief describes him, is a guy who doesn't have a name, but always refers to him, I mean, he kind of has a name, you know, like Tim or Billy or Bobby. He's always happy, always smiling, always has people with him. Public relations. It's a great name. I love public relations. I love it. You know, public relations is coming around showing, look how everything is in here. One, the music is playing so the deaf people can hear it. Well, not the deaf people, but the older people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 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 hey, she can hear it and he's yeah. deaf. So there, that's, that's, I was that right. Was a so everything is supposed to look good, but when you have, when you look at it from Chief's perspective, and the perspective of some other people, it doesn't quite make it come off that way. Or I say anything else, but you go ahead. I was just thinking of the when I was working through the Supreme Court thing, and then the Chief keeps saying, you know, my husband's really old, and he's been trying to get me to have a baby, and I'm really happy to have a baby. 
and, and Chief would even probably build upon that, that it's not just like, you know, we kind of have like individual, now we're up to building, and Chief would even take it a step further and go combine, you know, the, the whole great work machine. Also notice, we can, since we're in this first one, inwardly they are right. She, she's all excited now. <laughs> We're rabbits. Well, she 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 we we're rabbits. She's our she's the wolf. She and 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 you know McMurphy starts with it as you know pecking party where you're a bunch of chickens who are going after one another. Um, but no, she's she's the wolf. Now, well, Virginia. And, and that is a, a perfectly valid point, and it was the direction I was going to go, so I'm glad you said it. Um, yeah, and, and, and to be honest, we don't know yet at this point. And that's the nice thing about being two-thirds of the way through. Now we get to find out, you know, where you're talking about Nurse Ratchet, where maybe she's not, like, necessarily all bad. Well, if he's the false prophet, then, yeah, she has to be in conflict with him. Um, if he, you know, is, like, that savior kind of quality, then maybe she is the bad one. We, we kind of don't know. We know that McMurphy is a con man, so you use people to your advantage. We know that McMurphy is a gambler. Those of you that write Gatsby, what's Meyer Wolfshine going to gamble on? He will he gamble on the World Series. Meyer Wolfshine is only going to gamble on something that he is going to win. If McMurphy is such a good gambler, he's only going to gamble on something that is going to benefit him. You know, so, and, and he takes a big gamble at the end of part two when he breaks that glass. I mean, he busts through um, because he's going up against the nurse who, you know, Alice is hanging over there because we know what's going to happen. Um, we, he's taking a gamble in, in the sense of um, you're... You're taking the cigarettes, you're making the nurse upset, you're rallying support for all these people who are not going to look at you as maybe being that potential hero. Are you going to let them down? How are you going to use them to your advantage? So there certainly is some serious question that would take place as to, yeah, which one of these two is going to be the false prophet? I think it's fair to say it's one of those two. Now, you know, from a rhetorical analysis standpoint, if, you know, Sarah's going, wait a minute, where she's go thinking Nurse Ratchet is being the false prophet, you have this ra ravening wolf and, and all that kind of start going on, um, what are you looking at here potentially as a rhetorical device? We got, we, we got illusions that are, that are taking place. Um, and, you know, there certainly are some other... And I mentioned there's going to be religious illusions that happen. It becomes really more in your face in, in parts three and four. But they've already talked about how the ESD table is, you know, ironically, it's shaped like a cross. So you're going to kind of be a little bit of a martyr, which um, uh, Nurse Ratchet has already kind of talked about that we, she doesn't want McMurphy to become for those patients. So also keep in mind, no offense, Virginia, with saying, let, let me go with him as being potential savior at this point, because, you know, he could be the villain. Um, if, uh, if he is the savior, what's the point of view of the book? Like, literally, how's the book being presented? How's the story being presented? Like, the narration is what kind of point of view? First person point of view. It's Chief's point of view. If Chief is one of the people who needs to be saved and McMurphy is going to save him, okay. Which, what's happening here? The person who is saved is portraying his savior in the book of Matthew, in the book of Luke. So, you know, where we look at Matthew, Luke, John, you know, being disciples, 
if if this guy is the savior, Chief is going to look at him as as being you know the big guy. I'm going to be one of his disciples. It's almost like the gospel of Chief, therefore, is coming across as one flew over the cuckoo's nest. So you know there certainly are some elements of illusion, but the big question is going to become, yeah, which one of these two is going to be the false prophet? So. If we're looking at potential devices down the road that, uh, you know, once we get done with parts three and four that we might want to take a look at, I certainly would think that, yeah, illusions could be one of those things. Any other devices noticing? Yeah, and and there's going to be motifs kind of popping up all over the place. But remember, motif is going to be any kind of element that that continues to reoccur throughout. So the fog is going to be one of those. Of. Uh, so, I would I, like with if if I'd probably go with illusions to kind of keep that um, you know go with potential religious at this point. And again, these are all questions. We're not going, yes, you're right, no, you're wrong, because we don't 100% yet know um, at this point. We certainly could, though, argue that there be some symbolism to kind of play off, you know, the religious idea. Maybe the EST table, you know, since it is shaped like a cross, has some kind of symbolic references to it. That table is going to start to show up a little bit more and become a little bit more prominent in parts three and four. Motif of fog. Any other motifs that you kind of see coming out of blue? Yeah. And keep in mind, too, a lot of these things, there could be some different, you know, categories that they fall into. But certainly is going to be the motif of machinery. If Grace were to go, uh, there's a lot of mechanical imagery. You know, they're going to be carried over, and both of them would be accurate. But sure, there's a lot of machinery. And Isa, I'm thinking of the passage that kind of made you chuckle a little bit in the poll. Virginia, what did you say? Size. Big nurse. Oh, okay. McMurphy's big, broad. McMurphy looks short. I'm big, but I'm really kind of small. Um, what's Chief's father's name? <laughs> what's his name? What's his Native American uh, name? A tree that stands tall. Like the tall tree, the tall pine tree. So his family is, you know, big personality, big people. And we know that he used to be big um, with, you know, football player and all that kind of stuff. Or at least he used to feel that he was big. So you have some size kind of concepts that are, that are going to keep coming up. And this is going to continue to happen. Um, symbolism. I think you guys had the question on your quiz. It was question number three. I was giving some of you guys fits. What does McMurphy make reference to when he talks about, I tried, though, at least I tried? It wasn't the World Series game, but it was trying to lift up the, the cement block. What is it? At least what was it? It was a control panel, but he can't lift it up. That's crazy. Why? Because it's like symbolism. For what? Because he can't lift he can't get the control from nurse you know so there's that desire to pick it up and there's and 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 he tries you know they, and, and yeah, Chief's like, you start to hear he might be able to, and then he, like his hands, he has blood coming down from grasping onto it. You know, you're seeing veins and popping in his arms and all that kind of stuff. But that control panel is something that if he can lift that up, you can overthrow the control on the ward and try to break free, but can't do it. With the color white? Sure. Um, and, and I think, well, tell, tell us about it.
you could certainly do symbolism with it. Um, Abby might take the same idea and kind of argue irony, you know, because it looks to be so pure and outward like we had with the, the, the passages from Matthew. Um, and that's where it's more of that explanation is the big thing as opposed to what you end up kind of calling it. Yes, it is symbolic. It could be irony. It could be juxtaposition, all dependent upon what elements of it that, that you would want to use. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I mean, in McMurphy's hair is red. He's bringing in color. He's bringing in gusto. He's bringing in laughter. He's bringing in personality. Laughter can even become a motif that you take a look at because they don't laugh except for him. Um, what about, and it kind of started to mention this already a little bit, what about animals? What animal references have we had? Johnny, what's Okay, we have the boxer shorts. That was a question for seventh period. Describe his boxer shorts. Yeah. Some of them went, uh, so you're like, that's an easy question. I would have known that one. Hey, you guys picked A. Or B, whatever you picked. Uh, Ethan? The, the dog? When's the dog? Now, I'm glad you mentioned the dog, because I don't want to talk about the dog. The dog is the the country where people don't talk about the news and bad country. The the one that Ethan's talking about is this is when you said when Chief wakes up at night? This is right after um, the beginning of part two. So they've had the World Series, you know, little escapade. And the chapter previous is when the nurse is having the meeting with the other doctors to go to see the man. And there's no other man. He goes to see the man. It's not even a question about The big thing that when Chief wakes up that night, he looks out the window and he makes the comment that it is the first time that he can actually see things. So what's going on with the fog? It's clear, and you know, talking about control panels and all that kind of stuff. This is a time when McMurphy is asserting control. You know, he's standing up, and so the fog dissipates. Again, when the nurse gets control, the fog tends to kind of come back. Um, something moved on the grounds down beneath my window. Cast a long spider of shadow out across the grass. I'm on big print here, so you have to turn this. That's where I am. As it ran out of sight behind a hedge. When it ran back to where I could get a better look, I saw it was a dog, a young, gangly mongrel slipped off from home to find out about things going on after dark. He was sniffing digger squirrel holes, not with the notion that you were digging after one, but just to get an idea of uh, what they were up to at this hour. He runs his muzzle down a hole, butt up in the air, and, uh, and tail going, and then dashed off to another. The moon glistened around him on the wet grass, and when he ran, he left tracks of dabs and dark stains of uh, water across the blue shine of the lawn. So he keeps going up. Um, when does he lose sight of the dog? I listened to him fade away until I could hear him, but he's in the box, so I don't know. Until I could hear with my memory of the sound. The dog could still hear them a long time after me. He was still staring with his paw up. He hadn't moved for a bark when they flew over. And he couldn't hear them either anymore either. He commenced to lope off in the direction they had gone toward the highway, looking steady and solemn like he had an appointment. I held my breath, and I could hear the flap of his big paws on the ground as he loped, and then I could hear a car speed up out of the turn. Headlights gleamed over the rise and veered uh, headed down the highway. I watched the dog in the car making for the same spot up the tape. And then stop. We don't know what happened. Can't explain what's happening. I'm going to jump up here to page 197. This is the last chapter of part two. This is after Cheswick. This is after the epilepsy seizures that Fredrickson has and all that kind of stuff. Crossing uh, the grounds back of the ward, McMurphy lagged back at the tail end of the bunch with his hands in his pockets and looking at Ethan. His cap tugged low on his head, brooding over a cold cigarette. Everybody was keeping pretty quiet. They got Bill to calm down, and he was walking up behind him with his black gloves on one side and white gloves and shock strap on the other side. I dropped back till I was walking beside McMurphy. I wanted to tell him not to fret about it, but nothing could be done, because I could see that there was some thought he was worrying over in his mind, like a dog worried about a hole that we don't know what's down. One voice saying, dog, that hole is none of your affair. It's too big and too black, and there's a squirrel all over the place that says, 
bears or something hits the fan. And some other voice coming down like a sharp whisper out way back in the street, not a smart voice, something cagey about it, saying, sick and dog, sick and dog. And then what does McMurtry do two pages later? He sicks him. Okay? So you have this, this mongrel, this thing that's kind of showing up, peering its head, putting its head in the holes that might not be any of his business, where and then you have McMurphy kind of being compared to this dog kind of idea a little bit later, right when he's about to maybe get his head going into some kind of business. Hannah was getting upset because of what might happen to the dog. Dog going one way, what's coming the other way? Car. What's car? Machine. We got a piece of mechanical stuff going on. What's the combine? A machine. Who's going to maybe try to assert control? McMurphy. It's McMurphy versus machine. It's dog versus machine. Let's think who, who wins. Or a false prophet who's going to send everybody to hell. We don't know. <laughs> By Friday, we'll find out. So, so your essay, you know, for this Sunday, constantly.